New Zealand's rivers and lakes are central to its proud global image as a land with breathtaking scenery and a pristine environment. But in truth, those waterways have long been contaminated and diminished by intensive farming and over-irrigation. So how and why has this been allowed to happen? In the second part of a special investigation, we've been to find out. There's a place. New Zealand enjoys an international reputation as an unspoiled paradise. But the rampant growth of its dairy industry, driven by large irrigation projects, is pushing its waterways to their limits and threatening the country's clean green image. The battle for the future of New Zealand's lakes and rivers is now pitting some of the country's top independent water scientists against their own government. New Zealand is the world's largest dairy exporter with a cow population that excretes as much effluent as 90 million people. These scientists argue that much of that dairy effluent ends up in New Zealand's waterways, causing most of the country's fresh water pollution. And they accuse the government of failing to confront the true scale of this pollution. It's an argument we put to Dr Nick Smith, the Minister for the Environment and former Minister of Conservation. Do you agree that New Zealand's waterways are in crisis and that the main cause of uh, freshwater pollution is intensive dairy farming? Uh, no, I don't. Uh, look, New Zealand does have freshwater challenges. Uh, yes, uh, we have uh, water quality issues that have developed uh, over the last 100 years as a consequence of urban as well as rural development. Uh, dairying is part of that story, uh, but uh, it would be wrong to characterise it as the only, actually, our most polluted water bodies are those in urban environments. But that's contested by Dr Mike Joy, an independent water scientist and vocal government critic. He argues that official reporting of water problems is often misleading. When you take in the length of rivers in New Zealand, then 0.8%, so not even 1% is in urban catchments and 40% is in pasture catchments. His research is backed by a growing body of evidence both local and international, documenting New Zealand's failing water quality. Take, for example, the OECD's 2017 report on the state of the country's environment, which Dr Joy himself contributed to, but only just. Well, there was a team from the OECD came to New Zealand to, to sit down and talk to people, and they on their list of people they wanted to see was me. And I didn't find this out till afterwards. I mean, I knew they were in the country, but I didn't know they wanted to see me. I would have dropped everything to see them because I thought it was really important that they got the right information. The team were told that I wasn't available by Ministry for the Environment staff, even though no one had contacted me. And I spent hours and hours on Skype to fill in the gaps that they hadn't been given by who they had been allowed to see. The OECD report linked the expansion of intensive farming directly to declining water quality and suggested a review of new irrigation schemes designed to further expand the dairy industry, but which could cause even more water pollution. To learn more about the effects of this contamination, we travelled to Canterbury, one of New Zealand's most intensified, most irrigated and most polluted regions. Irrigation has put Canterbury's waterways under intense pressure, so much so that in February 2017, some of them had all but dried up. Scott Pearson is an environmental advisor to an NGO with statutory powers to protect fish and bird life. He takes us to the Selwyn River, which used to be popular for swimming and fishing. Back in 1935 was the only other time that in our records uh, we feel it was this bad. We have been through three years of drought, but on top of that, we've had a growing proportion of water takes for intensive irrigation, and that has made this river less resilient. Elsewhere on the Selwyn River, Scott collects water samples. 
The drying up of Canterbury's rivers has attracted extensive national media scrutiny, polarising the local community. While filming with Scott, we were confronted by a motorist. I wouldn't film me if I was you. Well, we're completely entitled to it, I'm afraid. The reality is there's, there's millions and millions of litres being poured out on paddocks in this catchment, so, yep. you know, you can't ignore that. Yeah, a lot more science needs to go in to deliver the problem. Well, we try to get the science in there. You know, if you want to come here and say it has to be more science, then go and tell the government that we, we want the environment called back. In 2010, there was shock and outrage after the government sacked the Canterbury Regional Council. Commissioners were appointed and given additional powers over environmental decision-making for the region. Unlike all other regions with democratically elected councils, decisions they make cannot be appealed in the Environment Court. To see what large-scale intensive dairy farming in New Zealand looks like, we visit Mark Slee, a fourth-generation farmer. He was an early adopter, converting from sheep to dairy farming in the late 1980s. Today, he runs 2,600 cows on his 800 hectare farm. It was a financial decision at the time. It was just the sheep industry was struggling and we could see the future of dairying. We didn't actually realise at the time how good dairy farming was actually going kind to of continue on. In 2014, his farm won a National Environmental Award. Mark takes us on a tour. He runs 14 irrigation pivots, each on average half a kilometre long. By installing irrigation pivots, Mark has drastically reduced his water usage. The annual water use has gone from, um, you know, 800 mils a year. Now with the centre pivot, we've actually halved that. So the water we're using now is down to three, 380 uh, mils per year. So we're using a lot less water. Again, that's better for the environment. But even the 380 millilitres Mark is referring to equates to 3.8 billion litres of water used per year. That's down from his previous use of 8 billion litres. Yet 3.8 billion litres is still equivalent to 12% of the combined personal and industrial water use of Wellington, New Zealand's capital, a city with 300,000 inhabitants. The word pollution gets used a lot. I don't like that word because for me, I don't think we're polluting. I mean, the cows are out on pasture, they're out in the sun, it's a very natural process. So how many kilograms per hectare of nitrogen goes into the soil on your farm? According to overseer numbers, we're 60, sitting at 69 yes, of, um, kilos of N going into groundwater. But 69 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare is more than twice the national average. So how does a farm which uses more than a tenth of the water consumed by the country's capital and leaches more than twice the national average of nitrogen into the soil, win an environmental award. Many believe the problem lies not with individual farmers, but rather with industry leadership and government policy. I don't blame the farmers. They're, they're, they're businessmen working in a system the same as anyone will take advantages of loopholes if they're there. I think there's been a massive failure in public policy. If we had had half sensible water standards, then a lot of these expansions into clearly areas which are unsuitable for dairying would never have happened in the first place. Canterbury, with its dry climate and porous soils, is one of those regions. Its farms are almost entirely reliant on irrigation, guzzling 60% of New Zealand's non-reusable water. In 2007, growing public concern about the scale of water use for irrigation and the corresponding decline in water quality led to environmentally minded councillors being elected to the regional council. Eugenie Sage was one of those councillors at the time. She's now a Green Party MP. We were reviewing all of the limits on water takes and groundwater because Canterbury is an area with huge aquifers and a lot of water taken from those um, for irrigation. And the government made it extremely clear that they were not very happy about that and they moved against the regional council to get rid of them. Legislation went through in early 2010 and the 14 elected councillors were replaced with appointed commissioners reporting to ministers in Wellington. It was a takeover by a national government to ensure that it could influence key decisions about water management for agribusiness.
But Environment Minister Nick Smith rejects this. He was the Minister of Conservation at the time and made the joint decision with a government colleague to replace the council. The very purpose of appointing the commissioners was because I was concerned that the freshwater quality issues that needed to be addressed in Canterbury were not being addressed. They were sacked because all 10 mayors in the Canterbury region wrote to the government out of frustration that they were a divided council. We were a functioning council that did make decisions. We weren't stalemated. The council has still not been returned to democracy, which was promised in 2013, so... Uh, correct, but something major happened between them. You seem to have overlooked. The largest earthquake in New Zealand's recent history struck after we appointed the commissioners. The level of pressure that came onto environment Canterbury post-earthquake meant uh, that the government needed to extend the period that the commissioners were involved. But critics believe this was a pretext. We were having big rallies through the streets of Christchurch to protect rivers, but then the earthquake comes along and then there's really extra powers are given both to commissioners and, and the, the Canterbury earthquake recovery. And the consequences are very plain to see now with massive water pollution right across Canterbury and it's only getting worse. Another irrigation controversy has been playing out hundreds of kilometres away in Hawke's Bay on the east coast of New Zealand's North Island. In the first episode of this two-part investigation, we followed the story of the Ruatanafa Dam, the largest planned irrigation project in the country's history. Supporters argued the billion-dollar dam would bring much-needed economic growth to the region. But detractors insisted it would only invite more of the water pollution seen in other intensively farmed parts of the country. A regional election in Hawke's Bay towards the end of 2016 saw a moratorium being placed on the dam. But the story might not be over yet. Those against the dam fear that the project is seen by government as too important to be allowed to stall. It's also seen as a model for as many as 10 similar irrigation schemes around the country. They worry that what happened in Canterbury might be repeated here. Will you sack the Hawke's Bay Regional Council if they don't support the return for dam? Oh, that is a nonsense question. It doesn't deserve an answer. Why is it a nonsense question? Because the government has very clear statutes under which there has to be tests uh, in which uh, decisions are made uh, about whether a local body is dysfunctional. And I find it insulting uh, that you would suggest uh, that uh, a decision about a specific project would affect a government decision uh, about the appointment uh, of commissioners to a council. Nonetheless, in Hawke's Bay, we were told by one pro-dam councillor that axing the regional authority could be a very real option. Do you think there's a possibility that the government might step in and appoint councillors in the same way that they did in Canterbury? Yes. The Crown has a very big stake in this. If the council acts inappropriately or illegally or incurs massive write-downs of assets, they would have grounds to uh, sack the council and appoint commissioners. Critics of the dam also point to claims of political interference in the project. Leading up to a 2013 inquiry on the environmental impacts of the dam, Radio New Zealand reporter Peter Fowler had been investigating the scientific basis for the council's proposed strategy to limit water pollution. So I started looking at this issue of, of nitrogen and phosphates in the water. In the regional council's theories about what would happen, they said that nitrogen doesn't need to be managed. The council's controversial theory was that water pollution could be managed without limiting nitrates from cow effluent. But without those limits, said independent scientists, excess nitrates would leach into waterways, asphyxiating rivers. I wrote a story about it, saying the regional council says that, contrary to what everyone else says, um, they only have to concentrate on phosphates and nitrogen doesn't matter. When I ran that story, I got a phone call and something dropped off the back of a truck from the Department of Conservation, which essentially said that there were serious concerns in DOC about this theory about um, managing nitrate. So this document was given to me and then I was told to look at what the actual submission from the Department of Conservation was. 
Instead of lodging the detailed report they'd been working on for months, the Department of Conservation, or DOC as it's known, submitted only a short statement to the inquiry board. It didn't highlight any of the concerns raised in that detailed report. The document had been reduced down to one bland paragraph. All the references to concerns about nitrogen had been removed. And then a day later I got an email leaked to me from one of the very senior managers at the Department of Conservation, which discussed a meeting with the minister, literally the day before that document was changed. The leaked email from July 2013 states, the minister wants to see the submission we're proposing on Rua Tanifa, and he's concerned and is likely to query whether we leave it all to the environmental board to consider. The email also asks for the associated parliamentary briefing note on the dam report. That briefing note, and who exactly saw it, is an important detail later in the story. The minister has denied that he had any influence over it, yet an email showed that he had met with the senior dock management. In September 2013, the email leak led to Minister Smith being questioned in Parliament as to whether he intervened to suppress the report because of its inconvenient findings. Russell Norman was the co-leader of the opposition Green Party at the time. Did he give any indication to the Department of Conservation on the direction or content of their submission? Mr Speaker, the decision about the submission that was made to the Board of Inquiry by the Department of Conservation was made by the Deputy Director General. Very unusually, the Speaker, who's not particularly friendly to the opposition, forced the Minister to repeat his answers to questions because he plainly wasn't answering the questions. And, well, the, I have. I have. And the members asking, the members asking was, did I make the decision? No, I did not. Did I give an indication? No, I did not. What Nick Smith's asking us to believe is that the Department of Conservation did a huge amount of work, had a lot of internal debate, came to a very firm decision to proceed with this submission against the proposal on the basis of its negative environmental impacts. And then for some reason, um, the Department of Conservation mysteriously changed their mind after the meeting. It's just completely implausible. Minister Smith also denied having read the detailed report referred to in the leaked email. The member in the question has claimed that I had access to a report, that I did not do so until I heard it on national radio this morning. Order. Order. Uh. But during the course of our investigation, we came into possession of the parliamentary briefing note which the minister had been given. The note seems to show that though the minister said he had not seen or received the Department of Conservation's draft report, he was briefed on its contents. It states, the department's preliminary view is that a submission should be lodged. We question him about this. When this came to light in public, you said to reporters and you said to parliament that you didn't know about this draft document existing and that you only heard about it on that morning. But there was another leaked report, which is this document, which was basically a record of the weekly report sure, of sure. the 29th of July 2013, which clearly shows that you had knowledge of it because it was in... No, no, I... It was reported. All I simply say to you Can you look is, at that? Uh, no, what I'm saying to you is that if you wish to ask me questions yeah. about documents that were four years ago, given the hundreds of pages of documents that go across my this desk every week... This was a big week, national issue. I'm sure you must have some memory of it. Uh, if you want detailed questions about specific documents, I'm happy to provide the answer to you. What I categorically reject Right. is that any claims that were made of any impropriety but I'm giving on my you behalf, it is unfair of you as a journalist to put a camera in front of me and expect me to be able to recite detailed responses to documents I'm that, not are, asking you that to, are more than four years ago. I'm not asking you to uh, recite detailed responses. I'm just asking you to answer a very simple question. Did you have knowledge of that report or not? Well, what you're not going to do uh, is to ask me to respond on the cuff to a document that's more than four years old, I'm more than happy to give you a written response. We later received an emailed response to our question from the Minister's office, although it went no further than his earlier answers. It said, he did not give direction to Doc about the decision it should make, and he did not receive a copy of the internal draft submission prepared by some Doc staff. In the end, 
the Department of Conservation submission to the Environmental Board focused only on a small portion of conservation land under their control within the footprint of the proposed dam. Controversially, instead of making this land off limits to the dam's developers, Dock negotiated in private with the council to swap it for farmland. This would then allow the dam to go ahead. But environmental groups opposed this. They argued that Dock was not upholding their mandate to protect the environment, siding instead with development interests. Environmental NGO Fish and Bird took Dock to court to fight the land swap deal. It is curious that it's the Department of Conservation that is supporting this land swap deal when on the surface you would think that um, they should be opposing it. In August 2016, the appeal court ruled that the process to acquire the conservation land was unlawful. But a month later, the Minister of Conservation appealed the decision in the Supreme Court. Environmentalists believe that if the Department of Conservation is successful, this could set a worrying legal precedent for conservation land across New Zealand. Specially protected areas could be downgraded to allow them to be traded away. A dam company or other developer just needs to find a piece of land that they can get an ecologist to say is good stuff. And if that is um, also in line with the government's aims, then we would have very significant doubts as to whether any proposal would ever be turned down. But even if Forrest and Bird win this battle, they might face yet another legal hurdle. In terms of what the government's response to us winning might be, um, they have hinted at the prospect of changing the Act if we're successful. Last month, the court dismissed the Department of Conservation's appeal. Within minutes of the judgment, Prime Minister Bill English announced the government's intention to look at amending the law. Rui Tanafa. Comment? This will become a matter now for uh, whether we change the legislation. Although the judgment means the Rua Tanafa Dam is dead, environmentalists fear it hasn't diminished the government's appetite for future irrigation schemes. So what now for the future of New Zealand's rivers? Part of the answer might lie in the reframing of the country's relationship with them. In March 2017, a local Māori tribe succeeded, after 150 years, in their bid to have the Wanganui River recognised as an ancestor and be granted legal personhood. It was a world first. Jared Albert is a leader of Wanganui Māori. He's agreed to speak to us on behalf of the river, but first he must seek its permission. This river is me. Um, yeah, our tribal maxim is um, the river is me and I in the river. If you think about the way in which the river has been governed and managed for well over a century, it's been based on uh, compartments and constructs that have addressed the river as merely a physical resource. The urgent thing now is to ensure that the river is cared for and that we um, stop um, our degradation of the river now before it um, becomes the point of no return. The tribe's victory is not just symbolic. A legal framework is now being developed to endow the Wanganui River with real rights, protecting it from abuse. And at Maine, Wanganui's former mayor was involved in negotiations to secure the river's new status. No longer will an external organisation be able to grant uh, permission, consent to any other party to do anything that damages the environment. This river has not been subject to the same demands yet as other rivers in New Zealand. But I mean, who's to say that's not going to happen in the future? New Zealand's got a history of industries that have come, have been powerful and have gone. And the industries that have gone have mainly gone because we've either destroyed the area or in the case of wool, something like raylon or nylon's come in and there's been an alternative. It's just the lack of ambition. My own view is we can do so much better rather than trying to be commodity exporters at the bottom of the food chain from the bottom of the world.